Good morning, church. Uh, as Pastor just mentioned, uh, we have been in the works for the plans for what is going to take place today after the third service uh, at one o'clock at our wedding glade. Um, for several months now, actually, we've been in the plan planning stages of that. And, and I really appreciate that Crossroad does this, that we dedicate what God has given to us back to him. I really do appreciate that. Here at Crossroad, that is not just a, a formality. Here we really, in our heart of hearts, do give back to God what he has given to us. And I believe that is why he has blessed us so richly. Uh, I really do believe that. And so as a part of those meetings that we were having to get ready for this dedication service, uh, and weekend, um, pastor said to me that he would like me to lead that service, that vow renewal service. And I thought, well, that's fantastic. I love that because one of the favorite jobs that I have here at Crossroad is doing weddings. I love doing weddings. Weddings are so much fun for me. And, and so I enjoy that so greatly. And so when he said, I'd like you to do that, I, I'm all in. All right, pastor, I'm there. And, and I said, so that weekend, you'll be preaching on marriage, right? Because I really would like you to preach on marriage. And he said, no, I won't. But you will. And I said, <laughs> okay, all right, um, I can do that. Um, he, he knew that I had done some preaching before, but um, I had never followed Rick Betts before in the pulpit. So that made me a little bit nervous because he's such an awesome preacher, and we all know that. But God gives messages to each of us to share with others and if this is his plan that he would like me to do this this morning then I will willingly do it um, but I will be speaking on marriage but as pastor said this is not a message that is only for married people uh, so if you're not married if you're not married yet I want you to hang with me okay because this message I really do believe the one that God laid on my heart the one that he put in my mind is for all of us we're going to begin this morning with one of my very favorite scriptures on the subject of marriage, and we're going to end with another of my favorite scriptures, and I'll explain why that is at that point. Uh, and we're going to make a few additional stops along the way, and we're going to look at some other scriptures in between. But if you have brought your Bibles or your phones, however you brought God's Word with you this morning, I, I, and I hope that you did, uh, open them up, if you will, to Matthew chapter 19. We're going to begin to look at Matthew chapter 19, and we're going to read verses 4 through 8. And just to kind of set this up a little bit, um, this is a scripture that relays for us a time where some Pharisees came, and they came to Jesus and asked him some questions about marriage. And he was answering their question, and this is the scripture that records that. He says, and he answered, Jesus answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said to him, they, the Pharisees, said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Can we all agree right now that Jesus is the authority on everything? Sometimes I wish that we could get Congress and our state legislatures to go back to the beginning like Jesus took these Pharisees back to the beginning. I wish that we could get them to recognize that marriage is not a man-made idea, but rather that it is a holy miracle accomplished by God, not only that first time in the garden, but every time since then that a man and woman have been joined I wish we could get them to read and understand that in the beginning God created them male and female and that was his only intended union in marriage. But why did Jesus have to take the, or take the, the Pharisees back to the beginning? 
I think that he had to do that so that he could restate for them the purpose of marriage. See, they were asking a very short-sighted question, but it required a very long-range answer. They wanted marriage to be about them. And so that's why they were asking about divorce. Yes, they were trying to trip Jesus up with his answer. They knew that the question they had posed to him, he could give one of several answers, but, but they figured any of them would upset at least one of the groups of leadership of the Jewish faith. And so that was their purpose there, that is true. But the question that they used to do it, the subject that they used to do that with or to attempt to do that with, showed a huge deficiency in their own hearts, not in Jesus. They wanted to talk about divorce because they wanted to be able to divorce for just about any reason they could come up with. They thought that marriage was about them and their happiness in the moment in their marriage. That sound familiar? That's the reason why we have the whole problem that we do with the divorce rate that we have in America today because people think marriage is about them and about how happy they are in their marriages. We wouldn't have the problem that we have with divorce today. The numbers would not be what they are if we understood what marriage was designed for in the first place. I don't have time this morning to go over all of the reasons that I have discovered why God has created this institution of marriage to go through the history of mankind. I don't even know that I have a grasp on all of the reasons, and in fact, I will say to you clearly, I do not. I do not understand all of the reasons that God had for that. His ways are much higher than mine. His thoughts, much, much higher than mine. What I do believe is that one of the things that he was trying to get the Pharisees to see that morning and one of the things that I think he needs for us to see is that marriage may involve us, but marriage is not about us. Marriage is not about us. Marriage is about God and us. And that's why Jesus took them back to the beginning. Because by pointing the Pharisees back to the beginning, by pointing us back to the beginning, I believe Jesus is trying to help us to see this very vital revelation. God created humans for intimate unions that model the intimate union shared by the members of the triune God and that illustrate the kind of union he desires to have with us. He said it in Genesis 1.26. He said, let us make man in our image and likeness. I believe that one of the greatest intentions of marriage is to allow us to experience and the ability to share in the divine love and union that existed before time began. To allow for us to have in our marriages not only the ability to more fully be able to be created in his image, but that is another message for another time, but also the one for today, for us to be able to have a reference point or a picture that we can understand that begins to reveal to us the relationship that God desires to have with us because of his great and immeasurable love for us. All through God's word, from Genesis to Revelation, God's word speaks of us and him in a marriage-like relationship. And I believe wholeheartedly that that is why Satan attacks marriages so violently. It's why he's constantly trying to change the parameters of what marriage is. Because if Satan can mutate marriage, if Satan can infiltrate marriage with pain that is only possible with sin against marriage, if Satan can give us reasons to not decide to get married in the first place, then Satan can bring into question the great love of a God who would desire to have a relationship like that with us. Church, it is time that we stop standing around with our hands in our pockets kicking at our shoes and watching Satan scribble all over God's picture book of his great love for us. We have got to begin 
to defend what marriage is. Yes, we need to be at the marches. Yes, we need to be at the rallies. But almost more importantly than that, when you're at home and your children say something that they have heard in school or by their friends or somewhere else that does not give an accurate picture of what God designed marriage to be, speak up, correct it. Correct it then, correct it all the way through their lives so that they will grow up to understand what God intends in marriage and be able to have one that reflects what he wants to have with them. Amen. Pastor Rick and I were talking just a couple of weeks ago about this weekend and we were talking about just how many scriptures really do illustrate or use the marriage illustration. Some of them are more overt than others are, um, but absolutely it is found from the beginning to the end. Why? Because God desires, no, actually God longs for us to understand the relationship that he desires to have with us and that he had created us to have with him from the beginning. So I want to look at a few of the scriptures that talk about that this morning. Let's look at the first one. First one comes from Leviticus 20, verses 20 through through 24, and then we'll look at verse 26. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them, that the land where I am bringing you to dwell may not vomit you out. And you shall not walk in the statutes of the nation which I am casting out before you, for they commit all these things. And therefore, I abhor them. This is beautiful, right? It, it gets better. <laughs> but I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, who has separated you from the peoples. Go to the next one. And you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. It would be easy to look at a scripture like this, especially the beginning of it, and to say that it's just so many rigid commandments from a harsh God, but in reality, they are wooing words from a God who loves us beyond measure. Last week, we were reminded that the word holy means to sanctify or to set aside. When we get married, in fact, when we get engaged, we do just that, don't we? We sanctify ourselves to one another. We set ourselves aside for one another and for one another only. I will never forget the night that Lynn and I were engaged. In fact, it was such a special event for us that we pushed it out over two evenings. The first evening, I took her out and we had a very nice dinner. And then I read her a poem that I'd written to her. And then I asked her, would she marry me? Thankfully, she said yes. <laughs> and then the next evening, I went to her house and I gave to her an engagement ring. And from that moment on, we were set aside for each other. We were sanctified to one another. We were looking forward to our wedding from that day forward, and there was no room for anyone else in our relationship. And that's what God is saying here to the people of Israel. He's saying, this is the way I live. I want you to live this way too so I can see that you're mine and that you're true to me. He's saying you're a special and a beautiful people to me. Just as I did all those years ago and I do this morning, look to my wife and say, you are special and you are beautiful to me. God isn't being harsh with the people of Israel when he says to them, I want you to be holy as I am holy. He's trying to woo them. He's trying, he's attempting to win their hearts just like he's still attempting to win the hearts of people today. Let's go ahead and look at the next one. The next one comes from Numbers 15.39. It says, And you shall have the tassel, that you may look upon it, and remember all of the commandments of the Lord, and do them, and that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined. Now the Jews were commanded to have tassels that they attached to the four corners of the hem of their garment. And through that tassel was to run a blue thread. 
The reason for the blue thread was because blue is the heavenly color. And it was there to remind them of the fact that their obedience and their holiness set them apart as the children of God. Those tassels were a way of saying, of all of the peoples of the earth, they were God's. Kind of like what we saw happen at the picnic last week. If you were at the picnic, if you were there for the, for the baptismals, then you got to see a really, really special event. As we watched those baptisms take place, we were watching people publicly say that they were setting their lives aside for Christ. They were publicly standing there and declaring that from that day forward, they were going to live their lives for Jesus. It's like this. When they accepted Christ, that was a private thing between them. They felt the call of the Holy Spirit to accept the engagement request of their Lord, and so they did, and they accepted Christ. And just like when you and I accepted Christ, that was a private thing between them. Kind of like that first evening when I took Lynn out and I took her to dinner, and then I took her and read her that poem and asked her if she would marry me, and she considered the question. Maybe a bit too long, but she considered the question. <laughs> considered what it meant, and then she said, yes, I will. I'll set myself aside to be in a marriage with you. But at the baptism, that was kind of more of a public thing, right? Those people were standing there looking at the water and saying, I'm going to live my life for Jesus. From now on, when you see me, you're going to see me living for Jesus. And I remember one person said this, and it just really touched my heart. He said, if you see me, if you see me doing something I ought not be doing, tell me, because I want to make sure that my life is given completely to the Lord. And that was more of a public thing, kind of like the second night when I went to Lynn's house and she fixed a really nice dinner for me. And I went there with a ring in my pocket. And I took that ring out and I slipped it on her finger. And then everybody knew from that day forward, she was set aside for me. She was set aside to be my wife. And that's what I thought of in those baptisms. I thought, this is like, these people are putting on the engagement ring. This is really cool. And I think that that's the idea that God had in mind about the tassels. The tassels weren't a rule to oppress the people. They were a reminder of whose they were, that they were set aside for the God of call creation. It wasn't to, to rule over them. It was to restore them. It was something that was intended to make them smile like an engagement ring would make a, a prospective bride smile, not something to make them scowl. God knew they were human. He knew that they had the propensity to stray. But he loved them so much that he wanted to give them something to help them remember the awesome relationship to him that he had called them to. Just like we now have the Holy Spirit living inside of each of us who have accepted the engagement call of Christ to remind us of the relationship that we have with him and to remind us of that wedding day that we've set ourselves aside for. Let's look at the next one. Isaiah 61.10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Again, we see the wedding speech here. God desires to be in this marriage-like relationship with us. That's why he created us. This verse speaks to the fact that if we will allow him to, God wants to clothe us in righteousness. That is something we cannot have on our own. He wants us to offer to us the promise of a salvation that has no bounds, one that gives us everything that he has given to his son Jesus, the very one who is our Savior. But none of that, none of that would even work if Jesus were not the bridegroom and we weren't the bride. If we weren't the bride, 
because we have messed up. We've thoroughly messed up any opportunity that we have to enjoy in the goodness of God because of our sin. Each one of us has. But if we are the bride of the one who is able to fix our sin problem with God, then we stand to be inheritors with our groom, Jesus. We ought to absolutely be rejoicing in the Lord. Without him, we don't have any hope, any hope at all, of being able to put on the appropriate clothes for the wedding day. And in the very next chapter in Isaiah, we see the next verse that I want to look at. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. I can remember the day as if it were yesterday and not 17 years ago that I married my bride. The sun that day, by the way, we were married outdoors. We were married at the gazebo right downtown in Bridgeville. And the sun that day was so bright that I could hardly hold my eyes open. The sky was a bluer blue than it had ever been in the 34 years that I had lived before that and has ever been in any of the 17 I have lived since. The grass was softer and more green and more lush under my feet. And the leaves, the leaves were beautiful. They were special. They had a crisp edge that day that they've never had again. They were greener than they ever have been. And as I stood there in front of that gazebo with the pastors behind me and I looked to the back where there was a screen that my wife had stepped out of the car and was standing behind, all of that beauty of God's creation around me dazzling me with its beauty and it all seemed to fade to black and white as my bride stepped into the aisle and started toward me. And she kept walking and walking. She got a closer look and she didn't turn around and run away. <laughs> she kept coming. And she kept walking down. She was going to be mine. Mine forever. And I remember standing there thinking, now I know what Adam felt when he saw Eve and he said, finally, my perfect match. I was so excited. But church, that is but a feeble description of how your God feels about each and every one of us who has accepted his offer of engagement. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. God is crazy about you. And verses like this just illustrate so well how much he loves us and wants to be in a relationship with us, a marriage-like relationship with us. But some of my favorite Old Testament scriptures that talk about the wooing speech that God uses for his people um, that, that just shows the husband heart of God better than I think almost any other in the Old Testament come from the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 2, let's look at the first one. Verse 16 says, And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. If God just wanted to be a harsh God, who delighted in the fact that we were unable to meet with his standards, then he would have never made a statement like this one. He would have been fine with us forever calling him master. But he wants to be known to us as a husband is to a bride, not as a master is to a slave. Is there an authority structure in marriage? Sure. But a, but a godly husband leads with love. He doesn't rule with an iron fist. God does long for us to be obedient to him. 
but not out of a fear of what is going to happen if we don't. That's the relationship of a slave to his master. But rather out of a great love and a great thanks for the statutes that he knows to be right and good and pure and that will make us so much more than we could ever be without him. The relationship that a bride has to the groom. Because he knows, he, he knows of the thoughts that he has for us, right? Thoughts of peace, not evil, to give us a future and a hope. God isn't mad at you when you don't walk with him exactly like you should. He misses you when you're not right there by his side. He wants us to always be aware of that future and that hope that he has planned for us so that when we arrive at the wedding day, we can be found an acceptable bride because of his grace, his grace, and our faithfulness to that grace. Let's go to the next one. Just a couple of verses down in that same chapter of Hosea. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. That is beautiful old English. Anybody around here speak old English? Let me say it to you the way that I think that it could be accurately said. I will marry you to me forever. Yes, I will marry you to me in righteousness and justice in loving kindness and mercy. I will marry you to me in faithfulness, and you and I will be together forever. One of the reasons why these verses are so beautiful is because they come from such a loving God who is trying to woo his people, right? But they also come through the prophet Hosea, who lived during a time when Israel was being horribly, horribly unfaithful to God. In fact, so much so that God asked his prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute for the simple reason that he wanted to illustrate to his people their unfaithfulness to him. And so Hosea did marry that prostitute. And she bore him some children. And then... She left him again for her prostitution. And God didn't even let Hosea out of the marriage then. He said, no, I want you to go back, find her, seek her out, purchase her, and bring her back. Because God wanted to illustrate to his people that his faithfulness is unending. That his faithfulness never has any limits even though we can be so unfaithful to him. But thank God he has never changed his mind on that. Romans 5.8 tells us what, but God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There are literally tens, if not hundreds, of examples in the Old Testament of God's husband heart being shown through the scriptures. But I have to remember that this is supposed to be a sermon. It's not a seminar. I don't have three hours. And so we're going to move along into the New Testament now. We're going to look at a few scriptures there in the New Testament that not only do speak of this relationship, this marriage-like relationship that God wants to have with us, but also, and I think almost more importantly, speak to what is supposed to be happening now in the meantime. While we're engaged, while we're waiting for the wedding day, what is supposed to be happening? And so let's look at that scripture next from Ephesians. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. This scripture is awesome because it points out to us all of the things that Christ has done, 
is doing and is going to do for the sole purpose of entering into that marriage-like relationship with everyone who has accepted him. First of all, it points out that he has, by his great love, paid the highest price, laid himself down, paid the price that would allow him to call us his bride. He died for us. Now in times past, or for any millennials who are here back in the day, there was a tradition around marriage that really doesn't seem all that cool today in our current society. Um, And I can see why it doesn't, but the tradition was the tradition of a dowry. And a dowry was something that a prospective groom would give to the father of the prospective bride for her hand in marriage. And what was really uncool about it is that the greater the perceived potential value of said bride, the higher the price of the dowry had to be. But Jesus paid it all. There was no higher value he could give. And why is that? Because he saw such incredible value in you when his eyes rested upon you. And he decided that there was no price, no price that would be too high to pay to be able to look at you and call you his bride. Jesus is all in. He is fully invested in his desire to have a marriage-like relationship with each of us. And the awesome beauty of it is this. I truly believe that if you were the only human being that ever walked the face of this planet, that Jesus would have come and he would have died just for you. So in the past... Jesus gave himself for us. In the present, his love is being shown in that he is sanctifying us. Let's look at it again. It says, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. I said it earlier, to sanctify means to set aside, to set apart. Now, positionally, in the faith sense, I am and you are, if you have accepted Christ, already sanctified. But practically speaking, the word says that we are being sanctified now. In other words, Jesus sees me as someone who has already been washed by the word. Just as he saw Gideon as a mighty man of valor while he was still hiding in a hole and had yet to beat his first Midianite. But moment by moment, day by day, I am still being sanctified. The washing of the word is still taking place in my life as I hope it is in yours. Christ is still using his word to clean us, to get rid of our dirtiness, to iron out the wrinkles so that in the future, let me say it again, in the past, he's died for us. In the present, he is sanctifying us so that in the future, by his great love for us, He can present us to himself a glorious bride, holy as he is holy, without even so much as a tiny blemish, nothing, nothing to make him turn away from us. And if that doesn't get you excited, I need you to reach down, please, and take two fingers and check your pulse. (laughs) All right, we're going to look at one more scripture, and then I'm going to wrap it up. If the scripture that we opened up with in Matthew 19 was so precious to me because it teaches me about this relationship that Christ wants to have with me because it instructs me on how I can live in my marriage with Lynn in ways that shows Christ's great love for the two of us because it has helped me to come to understand volumes 
about marriage and what God is intending to do. And in fact, any of those couples who have sat with me as we've gone through premarital counseling, we use this scripture in several sessions because there is so much to see there. And if it is one of my favorites on marriage for that reason, then this next one that I'm gonna ask you to look at is one of my favorites for another reason altogether. Because it speaks volumes as to just how much Jesus loves me and how much he loves each and every one of you. This next scripture comes from John chapter 17. I know it wouldn't be church without John. So if you will, open your Bibles, please, to John chapter 17. And I know we're getting on in time, so I'm not going to go through the whole chapter, but I do want to share with you a little bit about what, ha what is happening there. John chapter 17 is one of the ones that, it, it is the scripture that records for us the prayer of Jesus in the garden the evening before his crucifixion. And in the beginning of the chapter, Jesus is praying for himself that he will have what it takes to be able to go through with and do what he has been sent into the world to do, that through him the world will not be condemned, but by what will take place on that next day, the world that he and God the Father love so much might be saved. And next, Jesus prayed for his disciples. He prayed that they would be strengthened, that they would be capable of standing up against the enemy, that they might be able to continue to preach the gospel, that the church, the bride of Christ, might be able to be birthed. And then finally, in verse 20, which is where we're going to begin to look at it this morning, Jesus turns the focus of his prayer toward us. Let's start looking at it at verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He says, I'm not praying for my disciples alone. He's just ended that part of the prayer. But I also pray for these who will believe in me through their word. That's us, church. If you know Jesus, you know Jesus in great part because somebody shared a word of testimony with you. It may have been a family member. It may have been a coworker or a friend. It might have been a pastor somewhere, but somebody shared a word of testimony with you. And that person knew Jesus because somebody had shared a word of testimony with them, as had somebody with the person who told them about Jesus, and so on and so on, back in time, 2,000 years, to the point where originally in your line of the testimonies coming to you, it started with one of the disciples. And so Jesus is talking about us here. Let's continue with his prayer. He says that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, this is really important. So I need you to stick with me on this. I'm going to be done soon, but this is key. If you'll remember, when we started this morning, we looked at Matthew chapter 19 and we looked at Jesus' answer to the Pharisees about their question to him on marriage. And he quoted from Genesis and from that very first wedding in the garden. And then Jesus added this statement to it. Jesus added this statement and it was of Adam and Eve that he was speaking and he was speaking of every other man and woman who had been joined in marriage and is joined in marriage. And he said, and so they are no longer two, but one. This oneness that we speak of in marriage is the same oneness that Paul was talking about in Ephesians 5 when he says, it's a great mystery, but I speak of Christ in the church or I speak of Christ and his bride. It's the same oneness that Jesus is talking about in this verse in his prayer. Essentially, what Jesus is praying here is that we will someday come to a place where we will want to enter into that marriage-like relationship with him. That's his prayer in the garden that night. 
Let's continue. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. Now you've heard Pastor Rick say it, and I'm going to say it again right now. We stand to be heirs with Christ as his bride because he is the groom. And all that God has given to him will be given to us. And there are those who will say that the glory that's being spoken of here only refers to the Holy Spirit. It doesn't refer to all of the rest of it. And I'm okay with that because even us having knowledge of the Holy Spirit, we would only have, we only have access to the Holy Spirit because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. God the Father sent the Holy Spirit to dwell with Jesus and God through the name of Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit to dwell with us. Spiritually speaking, there is nothing that we have. There is nothing that we can have. Anything that we can possess, spiritually speaking, comes to us only because and directly through the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Let's continue. That they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in me, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Because we have this marriage-like relationship or this promise of this marriage-like relationship with Jesus, we have some abilities and some responsibilities that those of the world don't have. We are to live in unity with each other. Why is that? Well, I think that it's because we need to let the world see something other than what the world produces. And if we live in unity with one another, then we look different. And if we look different, then there is the opportunity for the world to want to share in the relationship with Christ that we share in our relationship with Christ. Let's continue. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, again, he's speaking of us, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. This is one of my favorite verses I think this is probably my favorite verse in all of the Bible. The reason why that is is because Jesus here is deep in prayer. Earnest prayer. He is praying for himself because he knows what's coming the next day. He knows of the almost inhuman beating that he is going to take. He knows of this, the ridicule and the scorn from those he loves. He knows of his crucifixion, a method of dying that the Romans had, a method of, of killing a criminal that the Romans had that the Jews didn't think was worthy of a dog. And he's praying for the power to be able to do that. And at that same time, he can't help but think of his disciples, these men he's walked with for three years, who've, who've gone through it with him, who've been fighting in the trenches with him. He can't help but think of them, and so he prays for them too. Prays for their strength. He could pray that they'd be taken out of the world, but he says very clearly, not that they're taken out of the world, but that they're empowered to live in the world. And then he prays for you and me. How he could have his mind on you and me is beyond me at a time like that. But he prays for you and me. And while praying for you and me, Jesus shows his hand. He says something here that indicates the motive for why he came to the world. Why he lived his life here. Why he had the ministry that he had and why he was going to die and be resurrected. He says it all right here. And it's because essentially he's saying this, I don't want to spend one minute, not one solitary minute of eternity without you and without me right there with him. 
Wow. Wow. For you loved me before the foundation of the world, O righteous Father. The world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. He said it again. He wants to be together with us forever. Kind of like until death do you part, only he has defeated death. One of the reasons, one of the reasons that God created the institution of marriage was to give us a good picture of the relationship that he wants to have with us. He knew what was going to transpire later on in the Garden of Eden. He knew that man would fall. And so he gave us an institution that he also knew would follow us down through the history of time. He gave us that institution of marriage so that when his son came as the second Adam to write what the first Adam had ruined, we would be able to recognize the value of the relationship that the second Adam wanted to have with us. And that's why marriage is so important. That's why it's vital that we understand marriage may include us, but it's not about us. It's not about us. It's about God and us. Now, after the third service today, we are going to go out and we are going to dedicate the wedding glade. And as we've said before, as a part of that, we are going to have the very first service there. And it's going to be a wedding vow renewal. And I hope that any of you who are married will join us. And I hope those of you who aren't married will join us so that you can share in the joy of those who do decide to renew their vows. But because it's a dedication, I thought, you know, I know what dedication means, but what does the dictionary say about dedication? And so I looked it up, and this is what it says. If you could go to that slide, please. The first definition is an act or a rite of dedicating to a divine being or to a sacred use. For example, the dedication of the wedding glade. The second is a devoting or setting aside for a particular purpose. For example, we will dedicate the wedding glade to be used for weddings and for vow renewals. The third is a name and often a message prefixed to a literary, musical, or artistic production in tribute to a person or a cause. And we will dedicate that wedding glade today to the Lord of Lords and to the King of Kings. And fourth, it is a self-sacrificing devotion and loyalty. As we could say, we are grateful for the dedication of those who planned, planted, and have watered the trees in our wedding glade. And finally, it is a ceremony to mark the official completion or opening of something. And we will be dedicating the wedding glade after the third service. And that's what that special service is going to be for, to do all of those things. We're going to be dedicating it and setting it aside that that space right out there will be used for the purposes and the plans of God as it pertains to the joining of couples and families. In that prescribed use, people will come there and they will dedicate or rededicate themselves to one another. Those who use it today and who will use it in many days to come will be there to publicly declare that they are setting themselves aside for one another for the rest of their lives. And I'm very excited about that because as I said earlier, Lynn and I got married outside and I loved that. That was so special. It was awesome to be outside in God's creation as he created oneness from the two of us. And so I really like that idea. And so I'm so thankful that we're going to have that here at Crossroad. So that a couple comes, who comes here and who wants to be married here 
can be married here at the church, either in the church or outside in the wedding glade. So I'm excited about that. I think that that's a great thing. But there's another dedication that needs to take place for all of us. We all need to come to a place where we dedicate our lives, where we set our lives apart for the one who has always, always desired a marriage-like relationship with us. He has been wooing us throughout history and scripture. He even created the institution of marriage so that we would understand what he wants to have with us and we would want to have it too. That we were created for that relationship. We were created for that relationship. Jesus has already done it all. He's done everything that he needs to do to express his interest in us. He is dedicated to us. Shouldn't we be dedicated to him also? Won't you stand with me? Now maybe you've been listening to me today and you didn't know that Jesus wanted to have a marriage-like relationship with you. Or maybe you just never heard it described that way. But now that you have, you know that it means you need to set your life apart for the one who laid his down for you. And I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I believe that when Jesus went to the cross, he knew the weight of the sins of the whole world. And I also believe that when Jesus went to the cross, he knew the weight of every individual sin and to whom it belonged. And none of that, none of that, none of anything you've ever done, none of anything I've ever done or anything we will ever dream up doing caused him to turn and walk away. And so with that awesome thought in mind, if you're here this morning and you've never done that. You've never set your life aside for Jesus and you need to do that this morning. Or if you're like one of the couples that's gonna come and renew their vows later today, you do know who Christ is. You do have a relationship with him, but you need to renew it. You need to rededicate it. Then I would just encourage you to lift your hand. Raise your hand up. Don't be bashful. Be courageous and raise your hand if that's something that you wanna do this morning so we can pray with you. All right. I don't see any hands. And so I'm going to believe that you have all done that. And I'm going to rejoice that you have all done that. Pastor would say that we have seven days. Seven days to be set aside for Christ. Seven days to live lives that allow others to see the difference that Jesus makes inside of each of us. And so I encourage you to set aside the next seven days for him. Live those days, especially for your groom to be Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much because you are so, so, so good to us. Lord, you have chased after us all of our lives and you have shown us how much you love us and how much you desire to be with us and to be in relationship with us. Lord, help us to live our lives in ways that reflect not only that we know that, but Lord, that we so gratefully, gratefully appreciate it. Lord, I pray for each of these as they leave here today. Lord, I pray for a special blessing from you on their lives. Lord, pour out for them a blessing that is greater than they can contain. In Jesus' name, amen.